morning. The Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. We're meeting today to discuss seven bills spanning the subcommittee's jurisdiction from western water to, wild, uh, to wetland conservation. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and ranking member or their designees. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and helps members keep their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing. Whichever comes first, and hearing no objection, that is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the hearing notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. So thank you all for joining us today. We're discussing bills focused on combating invasive species, conserving vulnerable animals and unique ecosystems, and improving our nation's water data and drought resiliency. First bill we'll hear is Representative Evans, H.R. 6949, the Delaware River, River Basin Conservation Reauthorization Act. This legislation reauthorizes the Delaware River Basin Restoration Program through 2030. Uh, the Delaware River Basin supports a water-based economy worth more than $21 billion annually and 600,000 jobs thanks to recreation, water resources, ecotourism, habitat, agriculture, and shipping benefits. In 2016, the Delaware Basin Conservation Act was signed into law to identify, prioritize, and implement restoration activities in the basin. $26 million, funding 123 projects, have supported recreation, water quality and management, and habitat restoration efforts. Reauthorizing this program will protect the basin's ecosystems and enhance public recreation. The bill also includes updates to ensure that projects in small, rural, and disadvantaged communities receive additional federal support. The next bill on the agenda is Representative Cohen's H.R. 7398, the Prohibit Wildlife Killing Contests Act. This bill will ban harmful wildlife killing contests on federal lands. These contests where competitors aim to kill the most largest or smallest animals in an allotted amount of time do not contribute to wildlife management. They can directly conflict with, the, with animal conservation goals of our federal agencies as well. Thousands of valuable native predators and other species are killed in these competitions, including coyotes, foxes, bobcats, and mountain lions. Eight states have outlawed these cruel competitions outright. These contests have names like Santa Slay or Coyote Carnage. The bill does, however, provide an exception for contests that exclusively target fish, deer, and their relatives, certain birds, and invasive species, and it requires our federal agencies to develop regulations prohibiting these harmful wildlife killing contests on our public lands. I understand some on this committee have asked questions about whether the list of invasive, uh, invasive species exempted from the bill captures all invasive species. I think that's something that we're happy to clarify and refine in the text as the bill moves forward. The next bill we'll discuss is H.R. 7801, a bipartisan bill introduced by Representative Mike Levin and Representative Mast of Florida. Uh, it amends the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972, or the CZMA, to strengthen estuary habitat protections. Estuaries, of course, are crucial for ecosystem health and recreation, preserving the lands and waterways surrounding them. And this, will, uh, this legislation will protect coastal communities and mitigate climate change impacts. The CZMA established the Coastal and Estuarine Land Conservation Program, uh, CELCP, uh, acronym is KELP, uh, and it gives grants to state and local governments for land acquisition and to safeguard coastal ecosystems and wetlands. Uh, the program's authorization expired in 2013, and Congress stopped appropriating money for the program. So this bill authorizes $60 million annually to fund it through 2026. Additionally, it expands the program to include climate change mitigation measures, such as restoring developed property in vulnerable estuaries and other coastal areas. Next, we'll hear Representative Stefanik's 
H.R. 6936, the Stamp Out Invasive Species Act. This bill directs the United States Postal Service to issue a semi-postal stamp, the profits of which go toward federal programs that combat invasive species. Then we'll discuss Representative David Joyce's H.R. 4768, the Defend the Great Lakes Act, which directs the Army Corps of Engineers to initiate at least five projects in the Great Lakes to combat wetland erosion and degradation. And we'll consider two water-related bills today from Representative Melanie Stansberry. H.R. 7792 and H.R. 7793, these bipartisan bills advance several solutions to help communities that uh, continue to explore unprecedented, uh, continue to navigate uh, unprecedented drought conditions that are fueled by climate change. Of course, we recently enacted the bipartisan infrastructure law that delivers the largest single federal investment in Western drought resiliency we've seen in a generation. Representative Stansbury's bills will complement the work we've done there and provide additional support for communities. The first bill, um, the first of her bills is the Water Data Act. It establishes a national framework for sharing, integrating, and utilizing water data. In the U.S., water data is collected by a variety of state and federal entities with different standards, meaning this data can often be challenging to even find and use. So modernizing water data and enhancing federal agency coordination will help the management of our increasingly limited water resources. Representative Stansbury's second bill, the Rio Grande Water Scarcity Act, Water Security Act, they've got scarcity too, but they need security. Uh, it convenes a federal working group to develop and implement a water management plan for the Rio Grande Basin. Rio Grande provides water for numerous communities, tribes, agriculture, and endangered species. But uh, these water supplies are subject to shortage and stress in this drought-plagued basin. The bill supports the planning and investments needed to make sure that the basin has a more secure water supply. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues and our invited witnesses about all the bills today. And with that, I'll turn it over to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence in delaying the, the beginning of the hearing. Um, the subcommittee meets today to hear testimony on seven bills Two of the bills before us are Republican bills that either do not increase federal authorizations or encourage voluntary contributions to enhance conservation. In contrast, the Democrat bills before us today preempt state wildlife laws or authorize new programs and new funding obligations. H.R. 4768 by Mr. Joyce of Ohio aims to improve the coastline of the Great Lakes by requiring the Secretary of Army to initiate five project projects to reduce loss and degradation of coastal wetlands. The bill requires a non-federal cost share for construction and requires non-federal interests to cover 100% of the operation, maintenance, and rehabilitation costs. These cost share requirements are important for ensuring the taxpayer money goes further. <coughs> Excuse me. I ask unanimous consent to offer Mr. Joyce's statement for the record on this bill. Without objection. H.R. 6936 by Ms. Stefanik of New York <coughs> would create a new combating invasive species semi-postal stamp that would be offered by the U.S. Postal Service. Proceeds from this new stamp would be directed to the United States Department of Agriculture and the Department of the Interior for programs that work to combat invasive species. As we are all aware on this committee, invasive species have a devastating impact on landscapes across the country and can cause serious negative consequences for native species. This bill is not a panacea, but it creates, but is a creative way to raise funding and awareness to address this issue. I would like to welcome Tim Myhook to the uh, subcommittee and look forward to hearing his perspective on how this legislation would help with invasive species. I ask unanimous consent to offer Ms. Stefanik's statement for the record on this bill. Without objection. I look forward to hearing testimony on these bills and other bills, but I want to briefly focus on H.R. 7398 by Mr. Cohen of New York. This bill aims to ban wildlife hunting contests on federal lands for invasive predators like coyotes that decimate livestock and at-risk species across the country. As everyone on the committee is well aware, state fish and wildlife agencies have long been recognized as the primary managers of fish and wildlife in the United States. This is something that Congress and our nation's courts have affirmed time and time again. Unfortunately, this bill would prevent states from being able to manage coyotes and other wildlife on federal lands within their state borders. For this reason, I strongly oppose this bill and ask unanimous consent to submit for the record letters of opposition from the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and the Public Lands Council. Without objection. Unfortunately, we will not be able to question any federal witnesses at this hearing on this and the other bills, and I would hope that we have a federal witness for every legislative hearing in the future. 
With that, I look forward to our panel's witnesses today and yield back. Uh, I thank the ranking member. Uh, is Mr. Westerman going to make an opening statement? Okay. Great. Then uh, we will move on to our first panel. Uh, we're going to start by hearing from the lead sponsors of the bills on today's agenda. Under committee rules, uh, we ask them to limit oral, oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. Uh, I don't need to explain about the red, green, and yellow lights. Members know all about that. Um, after testimony is complete, uh, please do remember to mute yourself. And we'll hear first from Representative Stansbury of New Mexico on her bills, H.R. 7792 and H.R. 7793. Mr. Ms. Stansbury, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member for holding this hearing today and allowing us the opportunity to talk about these two game-changing pieces of legislation that will help to transform water management across the West. I want to start this morning by thanking everyone who helped to draft and contribute to H.R. 7792, the Water Data Act, and H.R. 7793, the Rio Grande Water Security Act. These two bills are many, many years in the making and could not have been created without the input and support of colleagues on both sides of the aisle who made important contributions, our agricultural producers, farmers and ranchers, irrigation and conservation districts, acequias, state, tribal and local partners, federal agencies, researchers and scientists, and conservation organizations, all of whom helped to shape and craft the legislation that's before us today. I also want to offer a special thanks and a warm welcome to Mr. Mike Hammond, who is New Mexico's state engineer and is who is here to testify on behalf of these pieces of legislation, as well as our state land commissioner, Ms. Stephanie Garcia Richards, who's also a great water and lands champion in our state. In New Mexico and across the West, our communities are facing an unprecedented millennial drought and water issues that we know are unlikely to abate in the near future. As we know, water is life, and yet we do not have the most basic information at our fingertips to manage water. Information about groundwater needed for livestock wells, information about the flow of water in our acequias and our irrigation districts, water needed for conservation and the preservation of various species. The Bipartisan Water Data Act is designed to address this challenge, to unleash the power of big data and transform water management, not only across the West, but across the United States, and is based on a similar framework that was undertaken two decades ago to transform and standardize geospatial data. This bill, if enacted and put into place, will literally help to transform water management across our nation by creating a national framework for sharing, integrating, and utilizing water data. The other bill that I am here to present today is H.R. 7793, which is the Rio Grande Water Security Act, to help address long-term water needs on one of the West's most iconic rivers. The Rio Grande stretches 1,900 miles from its headwaters in Colorado down to southern Texas where it empties into the Gulf. It crosses three states, an international border, dozens of tribes, and countless communities serving millions of people across the West. And yet we do not have a single framework within all of these stakeholders can work together to address their water needs in the short term as we face drought and in the long term as we face climate change. This bill, which is also a bipartisan bill and supported unanimously by our entire delegation, will bring a framework to the management and long-term resilience of the Rio Grande River so that our communities who have lived there for countless generations will continue to be able to live resiliently into the future. The bill also includes provisions to reauthorize the Pueblo Irrigation Fund, which is a crucial tool in helping our Pueblos, which have used the waters of the Rio Grande since time immemorial, to help improve their infrastructure and address their water needs as we move forward into a climate change future. These bills are vital to the future of water in the West and particularly in my home state. That is why these bills are bipartisan. It is why they are supported by congressmen and women across the aisle and across the West, as well as in the Senate. That is why they are supported by a wide swath of stakeholders, including the Family Farm Alliance, the Farm Bureau of New Mexico, Trout Unlimited, the Nature Conservancy, our states, tribes, pueblos, irrigation districts, and conservation districts, and many, many countless others. The time to act is now. 
Our river is anticipated to go dry this summer in significant stretches throughout New Mexico and the Rio Grande. If we are going to be able to meet the needs of our farmers, of our communities, of our tribes, and of the ecosystems that provide that life-sustaining support, we must act now. Congress must enact legislation to help support these communities and their future resilience. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. We'll next hear from Representative Evans of Pennsylvania on his bill, H.R. 6949, the Delaware River Basin Conservation Reauthorization Act of 2022. Representative Evans, welcome to the committee. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you and the ranking member uh, in terms of the subcommittee on water, ocean, and wildlife for, for holding this hearing on the important legislative effort to come conserve natural resources and wetlands and water systems. I'm proud today to discuss my bill, H.R. 6949, the Delaware River Basin Conservation Reauthorization Act, which will reaffirm Congress' commitment to protecting the Delaware River watershed by reauthorizing the original act passed in 2016. This bipartisan bill was drafted with the support of my good friends, Representative Brian Fitzpatrick, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, and former Representative Doug Gallo. The Delaware River watershed is an economic environment, head start for the Mid Atlantic. The watershed creates thousands of jobs and provides water to millions of Americans. Protecting the river and the surrounding environment is the utmost importance to the residents of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, we must, we must not only protect this key environmental region, but we must also work to increase economic opportunity and environmental justice for the 8 million Americans who live in this basin. Overseen by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the program serves and conserves for thousands of Americans. It is very important. Through the Delaware River Watershed Conservation Fund, the program has funded 123 projects in the Delaware River Basin since 2016. It is extremely important, and we all understand that we have to work together. Funding has been utilized by the Delaware River Basin Commission, which oversees interstate rivers and water resources. Projects, it is important, and in New York, and friends of the upper Delaware River are using funds to improve trout habitation and create public access projects. That is something that we all need to know and understand. And under this legislation, the federal cost share of projects in these communities will be raised by 90% under the Secretary of Interior. It is also important to remember Chairman Carper of the Senate Committee of Environmental in the Senate has also introduced a companion bill so I say to you that we have a chance to make this happen. I appreciate the leadership of the chairman and the ranking member, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to pass this important and necessary bipartisan legislation for the American people and help the Delaware River Restore Program continue to improve. I look, I hope that we can get unanimous consent to enter this in the record and the less support from the coalition of the Delaware River Watershed. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for allowing me to have this opportunity. And I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Evans. And without objection, that letter of support will be entered into the record. Before we go to our second panel, I'd like to submit statements for the record from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, I agree with the Ranking Member. We always prefer to have administration witnesses here with us. But we did invite them to testify, and in lieu of in-person testimony, they've provided these statements. Members who have questions can submit questions for the record to these invited agencies. Uh, we will now transition to our second and final panel of witnesses for today. I'd like to remind the witnesses for our second panel to please mute yourself when you are not speaking to avoid any inadvertent background noise. And I will allow all of the witnesses to testify before we bring it back to the members for questions. We'll first hear from Ms. Stephanie Garcia Richard, Commissioner of Public Lands with the New Mexico State Land Office. The chair now recognizes Ms. Garcia Richard for five minutes. Welcome. Good morning. <clears throat> 
Chairman Hoffman, Ranking Member Bentz, and distinguished subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to join you today and express my strong support for H.R. 7398, the Prohibit Wildlife Killing Contest Act of 2022. I am a native New Mexican, born on the vast eastern plains of our state and raised in the beautiful Gila Wilderness area located in the southwestern part of New Mexico. I have family that raised cattle both on the eastern plains and in the northern mountains, and most of the public land that I oversee has more cows on it than people. I have the great honor of serving as the Commissioner of Public Lands for the state of New Mexico. With about 13 million acres under the management of the State Land Office and a responsibility to steward our lands for current and future generations, we work every day to ensure that our land management practices are sound and reflective of conservation science. Toward that end, one of my first acts as land commissioner in 2019 was to issue an executive order banning killing contests on state trust lands. Shortly thereafter, New Mexico became the third state to prohibit killing contests. It is my understanding that there are now a total of eight other states, including New Mexico, with such bans and several other states actively considering administrative rulemaking or legislation in this area. Wildlife killing contests are simply not a sound management practice. Indiscriminate and organized killing contests disrupt healthy and balanced ecosystems, and they don't serve any legitimate purpose. Just because a species is unregulated for game purposes does not mean it is without value. Predators play an important role in maintaining ecosystem balance with prey, and healthy public lands depend on them. These types of contests aren't about managing populations, protecting livestock, or traditional hunting values that are held dear to so many communities. This is generalized killing of a species for the mere competition of killing. It is a cruel, but also ecologically damaging practice. Now let me be very clear. I do believe that people should be able to humanely deal with an offending animal. Depredation to agriculture and companion animals is a legitimate concern throughout the West. But killing contests are not an effective nor appropriate way to deal with human and livestock conflicts with wildlife. For example, with regard to coyotes, the killing of an alpha breeding pair can actually result in other females increasing their breeding levels and litter sizes. Killing contests do not result in a more balanced population. The result is the contrary. There is simply no place for killing contests on our public lands. It isn't hunting, it isn't wildlife management, it's a barbaric decimation of wildlife without justification and shouldn't be occurring on our public lands. As stated so eloquently by hunter and director of Nevada's Department of Wildlife, Tony Wosley, as he was discussing the department's proposed regulations to ban contests, killing contests are ethically upsetting by virtue for most members of society. Hunting should not be a competition, as such behavior ultimately degrades the value of life and undermines respect for the animals being hunted. He goes on to say that in his ethics as a hunter, he hopes to defend a deeper and more profound sense of hunting than what he fears coyote contests say to the general public about hunters and their ethics. Hunters need to be conscious of the public image that they project and the way that the public perceives them. For all of these reasons, I urge passage of H.R. 7398. And once again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today and speak on behalf of this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. The chair now recognizes um, Mr. Nikki Gorpade, Government Affairs Manager for Ducks Unlimited in the Great Lakes Atlantic region. Uh, Mr. Gorpade, welcome to the committee. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member, and Member of the Subcommittee. Um, my name is Nikki Gorpade, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Ducks Unlimited in the Northeast. I'm here testifying in support of H.R. 6949 to reauthorize the Delaware River Basin Conservation Act. And I also want to thank Congressman Evans for his leadership on this issue. I'm here because I speak for the ducks, for they only quack. But more importantly, I speak for one million members and supporters of Ducks Unlimited throughout North America, as well as the 160 organizations that make up the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. For over 85 years, Ducks Unlimited has conserved 15 million acres of wetlands throughout North America, guided by the best science available. We have sister organizations in Canada and Mexico who we work in tandem with to achieve our continent-wide waterfowl conservation goals. Ducks don't know any borders, and we don't think we should either. This deliberate research and planning has identified the Delaware watershed as a priority landscape for wetlands conservation goals. And the Delaware River has a unique place in American history. 
Native American settlements dotted the landscape. The Declaration of Independence was signed not too far away from its banks. General Washington, in fact, crossed the Delaware in a scene that is now immortalized in a famous painting. And Jimi Hendrix played, in my opinion, the greatest rendition of the Star Spangled Banner on a small dairy farm in the upper part of the watershed. The region, however, has suffered from great habitat loss and degraded water quality, but it still remains significant. It's one of the most populous regions of the country and supports a thriving economy, as well as diverse communities, and still has remnants of that stunning ecosystem. It supports more than 400 bird species, 100 fish species, and dozens of other charismatic mammal species. And the Delaware itself provides even more value to the people, 15 million of whom rely on its clean drinking water supply, even though only 8 million people actually live within its borders. The river directly sustains a $25 billion economy that's made up of recreation, the clean water supply, agriculture, and shipping. The Delaware River Basin Conservation Act has been a boon to the watershed and has been part of its resurgence. The innovative non-regulatory program has four overarching goals. Restore fish and wildlife habitat, improve water quality, reduce flood damage, and enhance recreational and public access. Since 2018, $27 million in grant funds have been dispersed, generating a further $46 million in initial partner contributions for 63 different organizations. And that's funded 123 different projects that has conserved 22,300 acres of lands and waters. The states themselves have realized how important this is, and New York has gone so far as to dedicate $300,000 a year to implement the DRBCA within its portion of the watershed. And the program has been critical to our work. And though wetlands only make up 9% of the watershed, those remnant marshes and swamps play an outsized role in the health of waterfowl populations. Notably, the area hosts the largest population of Atlantic Brant on the East Coast. And since 2018, DU and our nine partners have uh, generated an additional $2 million in funds for five different projects at places as diverse as the Sapona Meadows Refuge and John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. The watershed itself is also on the front line of the fight against climate change. Hurricane Sandy caused billions of dollars of damage in the watershed, but amazingly one community um, around the Coxall Creek uh, near Cape May, New Jersey was able to repel most of these damages. The wetlands around the community, restored by Ducks Unlimited, was able to absorb almost the entirety of the storm surge preventing millions of dollars of damages. The natural infrastructure there was put in place initially for duck and wildlife habitat, but it ended up being even more impactful for the people that live around it. These types of small investments now will provide huge returns in the future by enabling these types of projects, which are not only good science, but really good for the economy as well. I've been fortunate enough to hunt and fish throughout this ineffably beautiful landscape. And reauthorizing and improving this program will ensure that local organizations with local impacts will continue to do critical work in places that need it most. DU continues to support this program and its reauthorization to ensure that this precious watershed continues to receive the resources it needs. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, and ranking member for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm happy to answer any more questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Corporday, and I appreciate that you were able to work in the Lorax and Jimi Hendrix. We don't hear that kind of range in witness testimonies very often. Well done. Uh, we'll next hear from Mr. Mike uh, Hammond, state engineer from the state of New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Hammond, welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Huffman and ranking member events and committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HR 7792, the Water Data Act, and 7793, the Rio Grande Water Security Act. I am the New Mexico State Engineer appointed by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham to this cabinet position on February 7th of this year. I also serve as the chairman of the New Mexico Drought Task Force and the Water Trust Board that approves funding for water infrastructure projects across our state. I am the Rio Grande Compact Commissioner for New Mexico as well. During my 40 years of public service, I have not seen this degree of persistence and severity of drought that is occurring across New Mexico and the greater Southwest. Current 20th, 20th century water management policies and infrastructure has served us very well, but we're, we're designed around a relatively abundant supply period from the 1890s and early 1900s. Increasing temperatures tied to global CO2 emissions is testing the adaptability of current policies and water supply systems in the Southwest while introducing a higher degree of variability with gradual shifts from snowpack fed streams toward higher intensity summer storm events that our current infrastructure is not well suited to 
capitalize upon. The National Weather Service is predicting a third year of La Nina conditions that is both unprecedented and indic indicative of continuing drought. In New Mexico, we have conditions of extreme to exce exceptional drought with over 95% of the state in these categories, creating severe wildfire conditions, generating the most burned acreage in New Mexico's history, 700,000 acres and growing as two large fires are only 50% contained. Many of these watersheds may never be the same functioning water reservoirs they once were, further exacerbating future water supply conditions. What we cannot measure, we cannot manage. And what we cannot manage, we cannot plan for and adapt to rap rapidly changing conditions. I commend Representative Stansberry and the, the bill's co-sponsors for proposing this legislation. H.R. 7792 mirrors a similar effort led by Representative Stansberry when she served in the New Mexico legislature, resulting in the 2019 Water Data Act that guides a paradigm shift in how New Mexico agencies prioritize, manage, and share data. The New Mexico Act will modernize and integrate water data collection, storage, access, and use through a federated data model, much as the proposed legislation for the nation would accomplish if enacted into law. This bill would assist the USGS and many other natural resource agencies to collaborate and integrate a standardized water data system for federal agencies while assisting states, tribes, and local governments to help update and include their data for the public and water management use for generations to come. Title I of H.R. 7793 would direct the development of a Rio Grande Basin study that would incorporate some previous and ongoing planning efforts by the three states for sub-basins of the 1900 mile uh, river system that can be st the starting point for the federal planning effort. <laughs> the Bureau of Reclamation is conducting an upper Rio Grande Basin study in partnership with New Mexico to develop a suite of recommendations for ad adaptation strategies from the Colorado border to Elephant Butte Dam. The formation of the federal working group and the directive to work closely with the three basin states, tribes, and local governments will assist in integrating many existing studies and plans being conducted to use the best available data and science to review current policies and infrastructure, but would not include modifying existing compacts, binational treaties, and settlements. In my experience, authority for certain federal projects need to be reviewed for 21st century needs and the degrading hydrologic conditions. The highest degree of operational flexibility will be required as we look toward meeting the challenges in the coming decades. The Rio Grande Basin study would investigate these possibilities and provide recommendations with the concurrence of the states to Congress to help address the challenge before us. Title II of the Act would provide amendments to Public Law 111-11 to help fulfill a commitment made by Congress to address long-standing infrastructure and water conservation improvements needed on Rio Grande Pueblo lands. In closing, I fully support these two bills and agree that their passage will assist New Mexico, the arid West, and the nation as we address impacts to our water resources resulting from the uncertain future of observed and modeled temperature increases resulting from global CO2 emissions. What we can measure, we can manage. And what we can manage, we can provide well-planned adaptation strategies for future water resource challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and i also like to thank your very professional staff in uh, helping make arrangements for my attendance here today. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hammond. Last, we will hear from Dr. Timothy Myhook, Director of Lake Champlain Research Institute at SUNY Plattsburgh. The chair recognizes Dr. Myhook to testify for five minutes. Good day, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Bentz uh, and committee members. My name is Tim Myhook. I'm an ecologist on the faculty at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh, and I serve as director of the Lake Champlain Research Institute. I'm here to support the Stamp Out Invasive Species Act. Uh, these funds generated by this bipartisan legislation will help our federal partners work on key programs to stop the spread of invasive species. Uh, briefly, what is an invasive species? Well, we have a definition. There's an executive order 13112, which defines an invasive species as one, a non-native to the ecosystem under consideration, and two, 
whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm and ha harm to human health. Basically, an invasive species has been transported, usually by humans, outside of its natural range of habitat, often across continents, and once it establishes, can cause economic and or environmental harm. Other invasive species, often invasive species displace native desired uh, species. Invasive species awareness is vital to preventing the spread of future potential invaders. The proposed Stamp Out Invasive Species Act will provide an avenue for funding federal invasive species programs. We have extensive knowledge of aquatic invasive species here at the Institute. Um, in addition to our scientific research on the topic, we have written a, a children's story about the invasive fish hook and spiny water flea. Uh, my students in the lab were very interested in, in education and preventing invasives. Uh, water flea, spiny and fish hook water flea are small planktonic organisms native to European lakes. Um, our story is titled The Adventures of Captain Fishhook Water Flea. It illustrates the pathways and vectors used to invade new water bodies. Sadly, our fictitious story was written to help prevent the spread of invasives, but unfortunately at SUNY Plattsburgh, we recently discovered the invasion of the spiny water flea in 2014 and the fishhook water flea in 2018 into Lake Champlain. As is often the case with invasive non-native species, once they are in, there is no effective management to remove them. While education programs help, we need other programs to help sever the connection uh, these species are using to invade new areas. Connections such as canals and boat transport and aquatic systems. Humans are le like to move around. And when we do, sometimes we inadvertently carry things with us that we don't even know we're hitchhiking along with us. We fly, we move food in crates all over the world. We boat, we travel in vehicles, all of which are vectors for invasive species to travel. This concept is very similar to how viruses also move with us when we travel, except that invasive species are in our luggage on our boat or in our vehicle instead of in our bodies. There are new threats moving around our nation as we speak. The round goby, a fish from Europe that is already in the Great Lakes, is poised to invade other areas, including Lake Champlain. East of the Mississippi, the emerald ash borer, a non-native beetle that feeds on the leaves of ash trees, is on the move. The hemlock woolly adelgid, a moth larva, threatens most of the northeastern U.S. and could spread further. Kudzu, a non-native vine, was introduced from Asia during 1876 centennial celebration as an orna ornamental plant and now chokes out the forest throughout the southeastern U.S. Water hyacinth. An aquatic ornamental plant was introduced at the New Orleans World's Fair in 1884 and now chokes waterways in the south. Um, Yellowstone National Park has a constant threat of invasive plant seeds that travel on cars and motorhomes from other regions of the U.S. We often stock non-native fish such as European, European brown trout in our waters. We brought invasive carp to this continent centuries ago. Lastly, we've watched both the zebra mussel and quagga mussel and things like cheatgrass invade vast areas of the United States. I can go on, but you get the picture. Invasive species are a problem, one which can cause significant harm. Programs to prevent the spread are key. Vectors such as canals, vehicle and boat transport are a concern. The Stamp Out Invasive Species Act will help educate the public and provide critical funding to help federal agencies combat the spread of invasive species. Thank you, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Myhook. Uh, we will now bring it back to the members for questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself uh, for five minutes. I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Garcia Richards uh, on this subject of the wildlife killing contest. Appreciated your testimony and your, your both your personal background uh, as somebody very familiar with cattle and rangelands, uh, but also uh, a commissioner who has implemented a ban on these killing contests. So I want to ask you uh, to elaborate on why these killing contests are harmful to uh, ecosystems and wildlife and also to responsible recreational hunters. And then also, do you think uh, that these contests serve any valuable purpose? We hear this all the time, but uh, as someone who is actual, an actual land manager, do they serve any conservation pr purpose. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for those questions. So I'll just uh, begin with your last question about serving, serving a purpose. I think um, 
ironically, not only do they not serve a purpose, they could be even uh, detrimental to wildlife management practices, and, and the reason is because they're indiscriminate. So wildlife managers track population sizes, uh, areas, particular species. Wildlife killing contests don't target any um, particular population. They are wanton, indiscriminate, blatant, um, and so that sort of winds up creating, a, I think, an issue for wildlife managers. Um, in terms of disruption of eco ecosystems, essentially, um, you know, as we as we all know, biodiversity, biodiversity, eco diversity is incredibly um, uh, fragile, and you know, small changes to the ecosystem uh, really can have huge impacts. So when particular species are removed, um, and I'll just give coyotes as, as an example because those are the most commonly uh, targeted in these contests. So coyotes, you know, they, they help with uh, preventing the spread of Lyme disease, they help in removing diseased and, and dead carcasses and animals um, from, from the environment. Uh, and when they are removed, that very important, um, you know, role that they serve within the ecosystem is then removed and everything is kind of thrown out of balance. Um, and, I, and I talked before, obviously, about disrupting, you know, uh, um, their, their breeding patterns and right. things actually leads to, to increased um, uh, litter sizes. So let's talk about uh, the consequences of not allowing these contests. We also hear that if you, if you don't do these massive killing contests for coyotes or rattlesnakes or whatever the case may be, that you know, things will just be overrun by these pestilent critters. Um, New Mexico banned them. Uh, have you been overrun by, I mean, is it coyotes on, in every corner, rattlesnakes in every yard? I mean, what's going on? So, Mr. Chairman, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the result of the uh, killing contest banned in New Mexico has been sort of underwhelming to report. I, I, um, I can't report any... The world did not end? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, no. Um, and right. in fact... But it was a rhetorical uh, question, and, in, I, and you've in answered terms it. Of, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in terms of, uh, you know, implementation and enforcement, because we already have the relationships on the ground between our sheriff's offices, in particular for our rural counties, and our uh, game management uh, department, when we heard, uh, you know, tell of, of a particular contest that was being um, scheduled, those folks were able to really, you know, work together on the ground to, to ensure that that was, that did not come that. to fruition. Uh, Mr. Hammond, in the time I have left, I really appreciate your testimony about the importance of measuring water and how you can't really manage it, especially in the 21st century conditions that we're dealing with uh, if you can't very carefully measure it. Can you talk a little bit about the gap that this legislation would fill? What's going on out there when we talk about um, all these different systems and practices that are not talking to each other and do not enable us to sort of coherently uh, manage data to make decisions informed by that data? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking from a New Mexico perspective, we, we have uh, lots of different uh, resources uh, in our aquifers. We have uh, brackish water options. We have this produced water going on in oil and gas development, and we have uh, impacts associated with uh, various degrees of aquifer development that have not well understood that could have impacts on, on surface water, fresh water, uh, exchange between aquifers is, is beginning to be understood. We, we, every state in the Southwest has varying degrees of, of uh, work that they do to understand their resource, uh, but it's not well integrated uh, through the federal agency side, uh, as well as um, even at the state agency level or, or even local government. So I think by standardizing the approach and developing good solid databases, uh, that anybody can access uh, going forward um, it would be helpful to uh, environmental groups, tribes, local governments. So I, I think that's the main uh, benefit, I think, is to be able to have a standardized uh, data set to, to work from. Gotcha. Thanks very much. Uh, I will yield back and recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, we had to, I'm from Oregon, and we had a bill introduced in Oregon to ban, quote, hunting contests. So it was about four or five years ago. I had occasion then to do the research 
uh, necessary to determine some of the facts that were left out of today's testimony. Let me share them. Uh, there's about 300,000 coyotes in Oregon. The number of coyotes nationwide is expanding. Uh, the coyotes will be with us forever, have been with forever, and they're not going anywhere. They're better suited for our uh, environment than most of us are. The, uh, the, from 2011, about in Kansas, I'll use Kansas as an example, has a lot of cattle there. The producers lost 800 cows and 3,900 calves in one year to coyotes. Uh, when I was uh, still on our family's ranch, uh, I remember with riding with my brother up across a, a U.S. Forest Service grazing permit that we enjoyed the use of, and we heard a screaming noise. We rode over a little hill and saw a small fawn being pulled uh, two different directions by two different coyotes. Some other uh, uh, deer was soaking wet, dressed in sweat. She had been running back and forth between the two cows, they're very clever, uh, for an hour until she was worn out and unable to protect her baby. Uh, the screaming we heard was from the little fawn. Uh, we carry guns, so the coyote was removed. Uh, the deer uh, were, were, quote, saved. So what is the real purpose of your ban? The real purpose of your ban is to attack hunting and this method. Now, let me just share with you that in a small town not too far from where I grew up, about 60 miles, the local uh, Future Farmers of America kids, uh, kids arranged the contest. It's arranged at a time uh, prior to the calving season, if it's done appropriately. That's not always what occurs, but that's the idea. And the idea is to drive down the number of coyotes that are present when cows are calving. We all know they're gonna be back, they are, they haven't gone anywhere. Coyotes serve a good purpose. Uh, they eat mice and we're happy for that. But there is a certain point uh, during the year where you simply can't allow uh, your calves and the incredible value of each, each of those calves to to an operation to be damaged by what is a predator and a very successful one. I really have no questions for you because I've already heard all the answers and I want to go to water. So let me talk or ask a question about, about the, the uh, to Mr. Hammond, I believe. Uh, yes, um, when you get gather the data on how much water is in the, in, in the wells and in the groundwater, which I think is an extremely important thing. What will you do with that data? In, in, in other words, how will you determine the sustainable uh, use, if you will, out of those aquifers? I'm most interested in this because, of course, without that knowledge, we don't know how much we can use. And moving to the real issue is, what are you gonna do about reducing use uh, when you realize that it's being over, your, your uh, aquifers are being overdrafted. And I ask this because this is a problem across all of that, uh, our Western United States. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member uh, Bentz. It's a very good question because we're, uh, we're in a litigation in Southern New Mexico, Supreme Court litigation on that very matter right now. So the, more, the, the better the data that you have in terms of assessing the aquifer, the better you can model it. And, and modeling is a very key component. And the relationship between the surface water and the reduction of the aquifers that are connected to the surface water is a very key component to the preservation of the surface water uh, while aquifers are being developed. And then there, in New Mexico, there's layers of separate aquifers. I mentioned the brackish uh, component. How much can you develop that without harming the aquifers above, the freshwater aquifers? There, there's a lot of different components to adequately managing aquifers. And, and so by collecting the data, uh, putting the resources in to analyze and assess those, allow you to, to develop much more accurate models. And then you can decide, determine how they could be draw, drafted in a sustainable manner, or how the interaction between the different layers of the aquifers are causing unintended consequences. So those are the most important aspects of data collection and modeling that uh, I can share with you. And that's true across the West, right. or, or many, anywhere, really. And does the bill include uh, funding for additional monitoring wells, or is this going to be a matter of simply gathering information already available? Um, as, uh, acting member, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, particular bill is, is designed to uh, uh, create grants and assist local governments in their data acquisition and, and assessments. I, I don't think it specifically has it for uh, a particular monitoring, but I could yield to uh, the bill's uh, sponsor to answer that in more detail. Thank you so much. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Representative Stansbury for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And recognizing that we have a short amount of time here, I'm gonna to try to cover a lot of ground in my five minutes. So first, I just wanna take the opportunity to address some of the questions about data. Why do we need a Water Data Act for our country? And the answer is this, it's right here in my hand, which is that the single most transformative thing that has happened probably in modern life is the ability to harness data at your fingertips and use it to inform every possible decision from where you go shopping to where you get coffee to where you're gonna park your car every day, and yet, we do not have access to this kind of data at our fingertips about water resources. And the reason is it has to do with technical issues around how water data are curated, how they're put on the internet, how they're made available, and the ways in which we use that data to develop tools to help inform every part of our water management. This bill does not collect data, it does not tell agencies, federal, state, or local, uh, how to do that, but helps to create a framework within which we would transform the way in which data is collected, the way in which metadata and the technical aspects of data are put together so that we can develop tools and provide grants and resources to local entities to develop tools to help with water management. And the reason why that's crucial is that we see in, for example, geospatial data, which is the example I used, Mr. Chairman, in my opening statement, in 2001, when 9-11 happened, uh, first responders across New York City tried to bring together geospatial data of what was going on underneath the ground and across New York City. And what they found when they went and burned all these CD-ROMs and brought all that data back to the Central Emergency Response Center is that the data wouldn't mash up. It wasn't interoperable. And so we have a very similar and analogous situation happening with our water data across many different systems right now across the nation. And so what was undertaken in 2001 during the Bush administration was an effort to standardize geospatial data at the USGS in concert with federal, state, tribal, and local, and nonprofit and private stakeholders so that we would have a way to mash up data to unlock its usefulness. And so that's really at the heart of the Water Data Act. Secondly, I would like to turn to Mr. Hammond to ask a question about what is happening, bless you, in the Rio Grande River this summer. I know, Mr. Hammond, you've worked for many years across many different federal, state, and local entities. And I think what is really important to understand about this Rio Grande Water Security Act is that we're talking about the long-term, multi-decadal resilience of this river system and the ability to manage it at scale so that our farmers can get water, so that our tribes will get their prior and paramount uh, water rights. So Mr. Hammond, could you please just take a moment to describe what is happening on the ground right now in our river system. What does it look like? What does it mean for our people? And how would this framework that's in this bill help to address those issues? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Member Stansberry. The, um, there, there are some very uh, dire conditions on the Rio Grande as we speak. Uh, I mentioned the, 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 the fires in the watershed. Uh, we have damaged watersheds that provide the storage along with the actual storage reservoirs uh, that really sustain uh, the, the river throughout the summer months. Um, damaged watersheds begin to cease uh, the uh, reservoir capacity and, 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 uh, and sustaining the, the rivers uh, going forward. Um, but on the Rio Grande itself, we, we're, at the, we're about a third of the flow rate that we normally see this year from this year's runoff. Um, this is the third, this will be the third year in a row where we've had uh, well below normal snowpack and, and runoff. And uh, due to uh, a chain of events associated with the Rio Grande Compact debit, um, uh, we, can, we cannot even store water in upstream re reservoirs as a result of the continuing drought. So what that does is it creates a, a window in the late summer where there isn't enough water for farms, there isn't enough water for sustaining the ecosystem and, and even to meet our endangered species requirements under the uh, 2006 biological opinion. So we're, we're in a very difficult situation um, and uh, we, we don't have the luxury really of turning to groundwater as a replacement supply uh, because if we do, then we start creating additional issues associated with uh, groundwater withdrawals. So uh, all of it has to be developed in a sustainable manner, um, yet uh, we, we still uh, lack uh, 
sufficient resources to meet the basic needs during the late summer months. Thank you, Mr. Hammond and Mr. Chairman. I see I am out of time, but I just want to make one comment, which is that ecologically speaking, we know that killing contests do not address the issues of depredation on livestock, and I think that's an important point that we really need to highlight of our land commissioner's uh, testimony this morning. We have not seen in the state of New Mexico a huge increase in uh, the growth in, in our predatory wildlife as a result of our uh, killing contest ban in New Mexico, and we know that it's ecologically smart, it's humane, and it's the right thing to do. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Gonzalez-Colon for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and the witnesses, and of course, our ranking member, uh, for the opportunity today. I, uh, my question will be to Dr. Uh, Myhook. Uh, I hope I pronounce uh, well uh, your, your last name, if not correct me. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, like across many other states and territories uh, throughout the nation, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, how invasive species can negatively impact uh, natural ecosystems in agriculture and in public health. Uh, in my case, uh, we do have a problem with green iguanas, uh, mongooses, lionfish, uh, and feral pigs are just some of the invasive species that have caused serious damage and problems throughout our island. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned the need for programs that uh, may help uh, sever the connections invasive species are using to invade uh, new areas. Um, can you just tell us uh, on this point, elaborate on how you would suggest uh, this be done? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I feel your pain when it comes to invasive species. Um, yeah, there are a lot uh, of potential. And my one of my main points that I always make is once an invader invades, you really can't get rid of it. <laughs> the, the best efforts are spent on prevention. Um, anything we can do, legislation or whatever, to basically prevent the invader from, from being successful. Now, we have many species that try to invade and are not successful, but the ones that are that cause the harm, those are the ones we notice, as, as all the ones you mentioned. Um, yeah, my, my biggest suggestion is, um, and I use an analogy actually uh, for litter. When you step off the plane in Anchorage, Alaska, you see signs for with very high fines for littering. You do not see a lot of littering in Alaska because there's a very serious fine if you do it. You could do the same thing for boat transport or vehicle transport. There, we could have some kind of legislation uh, that basically there's a penalty if you transport an invasive species. And, and basically you just publicize that and most people wanna follow the rules, so they would. That would, I think, really reduce the amount of spread. Uh, we'd wash our cars, we'd wash our boats, we, we might be more cognizant of, of how we're moving things around. Thank you. And, and um, um, based on your experience, uh, what are some of the main challenge uh, challenges you you have noticed that impact the effectiveness of current invasive species prevention program, uh, or you know what other ways in which we can create greater awareness, like you just mentioned, about the negative effects of this issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Often they they become a nuisance themselves. I mentioned the two plankton that invaded Lake Champlain. They clog up fishing lines so everybody notices it. Throughout the Great Lakes, These they clog up anyone who fishes, it clogs their line. So those are invasives that become a very public issue. Uh, often it's their own nuisance. Quagga mussels are a nuisance. They, they uh, impact water intake uh, in lakes. Zebra mussels, the same thing. Um, yeah, I think maybe some some public efforts. I, I, I think the stamp is actually a really good idea in the sense of uh, uh, being pub uh, public. Uh, people can buy the stamp. They'll say, hey, what's an invasive species? They may go try to find out more. Um, I, yeah, I think uh, we need to educate the public about what these things are and, and, and how, how bad they can be for, for our ecosystems. 
Thank you. And in, in, in HR uh, 6936, the STEM, uh, our Invasive Species Act that you just mentioned, um, the, the needs proceed from the sale of this STEM will be directed to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior for federal programs uh, that combat invasive species. However, as you argue in your, in your testimony, this bill will also help educate uh, the public and raise awareness uh, can you, and I know we're running out of time, can you briefly discuss why awareness and education must be necessary component to any effort to comprehensively address uh, the threats uh, posed by invasive species and why education programs are so important to combat them uh, in addition to those initiatives that are more focused on actual control uh, and eradication? Yeah, education is really important um, because Many, many different members of our society are responsible for moving these species around. It's not just, you know, on certain vehicles. It's on all of our vehicles and, and we all travel. So educating the public about and the awareness of, hey, I might be moving something that could really be damaging. Let's say, for example, in the Delaware River Basin or in Yellowstone National Park or in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I might not want to take that from New York when I travel, drive my car there. So, yeah, I think we need to educate people about, you know, and, and I think generally people want to do the right thing. If we tell people, wash your car before you leave New York, they might very well do it. Thank you. And uh, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Levin for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Huffman, and thank you for including my bill, H.R. 7801, the Resilient Coasts and Estuaries Act, in today's hearing. This bipartisan bill, which I introduced alongside my colleague, Representative Brian Mast from Florida, would provide crucial funding for state and local governments to preserve our nation's coastal habitats. I'm proud to represent California's 49th Congressional District, which is home to over 50 miles of pristine coastline, as well as many cherished lagoons and other estuaries that are important for our local ecosystem, recreation, and economy. That's why I introduced the Resilient Coast and Estuaries Act, which would reauthorize the coastal, coastal and estuarine land conservation program. This program was created to provide grants to state and local governments to purchase land to protect coastal ecosystems and wetlands. When it was in effect, this program protected over 110,000 acres of coastal and estuary land. However, Congress stopped funding the program in 2013, and other federal funding mechanisms ran out in 2017. My bill would reauthorize this essential program and authorize $60 million in funding annually to help our local communities protect estuary habits like the San Mateo Creek, San Luis Rey River, and the San Elijo Lagoon in my district. This bill would also strengthen the National Estuarine Research Reserve System by requiring NOAA to establish five new reserves over the next five years and expanding research guidelines to include long-term data monitoring and modeling on the impacts of climate change. In the San Diego region, the Tijuana River Estuarine Reser Research Reserve works to monitor and preserve our local ecosystems. Reserve employees train local and state officials to inform local decision-making across San Diego County. By adding five new reserves over the next five years, my bill will expand the reach of the reserve system and improve the system-wide monitoring and data sharing programs. I'm proud this bill has strong bipartisan support. And I'd like to ask the chair to enter into the record these letters from the Coastal States Organization, the National Estuarine Reserve Research Reserve Association, and the Buena Vista Audubon expressing their support for the Resilient Coasts and Estuaries Act. Without objection. Thank you. I'd now like to turn to questions with the time that I have uh, left. Uh, Mr. Gor Gorpede, my district is constantly grappling with issues surrounding coastal resilience, rising sea levels, coastal erosion. Uh, they are threatening our coastlines, threatening, threatening my whole district. In your testimony, you talk about how wetlands have been proven to help mitigate the effects of sea level rise in coastal areas and have helped communities become more resilient uh, to climate change. Can you discuss further how wetland and estuary habitats help mitigate the impacts of sea level rise and specifically why it's important to protect and monitor these ecosystems? Uh, absolutely, and thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, we like to say tongue in cheek that wetlands are, are magical and Estuaries and uh, estuary and wetlands in particular is almost as if Merlin himself sprinkled a little bit of magical dust on top. They, they do amazing things for both the communities that live around them, but also the wildlife that depend on them. Um, they're pretty unique because there are areas where essentially two worlds collide, the land and the oceans. 
And these, the wetlands in particular in estuaries act as, as buffers that help stabilize the coast and protect coastal communities as well from, from flood damage and storm surge. And essentially they act as massive sponges that are able to absorb any rise in either sea level or storm surges and then slowly release them back out in, into the oceans or into the, into the water system. And for waterfowl in particular, and, and actually in uh, the chairman's backyard, uh, the San Francisco Bay estuary is probably the most, one of the most important um, places on the West Coast for migrating waterfowl. Uh, in fact, it helps winter about half of all of the Pacific Flyway waterfowl that make their long journey from the Arctic Circle all the way down to Central America. Um, additionally, they also provide a plethora of um, uh, uh, habitat and then also fuel for the, for the waterfowl there as well. And, Again, I'll, I'll point back to the Cox Hall Creek in Cape May, New Jersey, where these functioning wetlands, if they're there, are able to do potentially millions of dollars of work for a far smaller price tag and work for potentially ever. Um, uh, one other thing I'll add is the uh, idea of wetland accretion and sedimentation, where wetlands are actively building on top of each other and raising the elevation to then um, help defend against either a rising sea or other um, extreme weather events, and so they're actively working to build themselves up if they're given the opportunity. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for all that, uh, Mr. Gore, today. I, I want to thank uh, Chair Huffman uh, for bringing the Resilient Coasts and Estuaries Act uh, forward this morning. I, you know, it's an incredibly important bill for so many of our coastal communities. It's a bipartisan bill, so I'm hopeful that we'll have a markup soon, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Well, Mr. I Chairman. thank the gentleman for his great work on this as somebody who represents a lot of coast and a lot of important estuaries. Uh, I appreciate it. So the chair now recognizes Mr. Cohen for five minutes. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I've been kind of busy today, and I don't know if Mr. Huffman or our, our uh, uh, Ms. Stansbury has been able to say anything about this bill, but I have a bill I've entered. We've been talking a lot about your bill. Excellent. I'm sure that you convinced everybody to be for it because you're such two outstanding members. But this is a bill I've had for many years, and I think it's something we need to pass, the Prohibit Killing Contest Act. Uh, these places, uh, they shouldn't be permitted, and they certainly, should not, certainly shouldn't have federal land management agencies uh, involved in it. We want the federal land management agencies to develop rules prohibiting wildlife killing contests from being held on the lands that they manage. Uh, they offer cash, hunting equipment, other prizes heaviest, the largest, the smallest uh, of a particular animal, or the cutest, what a, what a, what a sick group of people th these are. Uh, you get an award for killing the cutest animal. They have the big dog, the little dog, the prettiest female, or the coyote with the biggest ears. Uh, these, are, these are just immoral purposes, in my opinion, and we need to look out for animals, four-legged friends. Uh, they've got a lot times than we do, and they certainly give us a lot of condol kindness and solace. Uh, killing contests are unethical, inhumane, and unsportsmanlike, and usually the animals are kind of served up on a, on a, on a platter. They ignore traditional hunting principles that include a fair chase, respect for life, and, and they would discourage wanton waste. So I, I think it's a good bill. Uh, it's a humane bill. It's a sensible bill. And uh, you know, the prize money in these contests that they have isn't significant. There was a three-person first place year's West Texas Bobcat contest took home $43,000. Uh, the Bobcat was the uh, only animal killed by the team to win the prize. They also had to kill at least five foxes or coyotes to qualify for the main prize. Anyway, sports, one thing, eating wildlife is, is, a, is a fine thing too, but killing them for sport and getting money, you know, in my opinion, is wrong. It's not the way I was raised. It's not the way I see people who care about animals uh, uh, living. And, uh, but this bill wouldn't apply to fishing contests, allows for some other exceptions. And um, under the bill, field trials and contests for hunting deer, geese, ducks, and invasive species are allowed, which is good because I love to eat deer and geese and ducks. And uh, got two articles I'd like to enter into the record, how killing wildlife in the United States became a game national uh, by National Geographic, April 27, 2022. Without objection, I like that entered into the record. Without and, objection, and the other is, and the other is a uh, Earth 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 is Land dot org journal, uh, a magazine entry on blood sport and West Texas bobcat contest, uh, and the, 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 the summer twenty twenty two issue of blood sport. So without objection, it'll be entered in the record. And thank you. And with that, I would think that 
my poor performance here after the two stellar performances by Ms. Stansbury and Mr. Huffman should be sufficient to garner the votes to pass this out and make it law. And I would hope that everybody would support it. Thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. It was, you were almost as good today as you were when you were unmuted accidentally yesterday <laughs> in the markup. Yeah, but we always uh, appreciate hearing from you, whether you intend for us to hear from you or not. Uh, the members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there's no further business, then without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>